All right, let's start with prayer. A merciful Lord, we pray this day for your blessings upon our study of your word, to grant us understanding of your word and strengthen us in our faith. Bless us likewise in our worship of you today and in the presentation of Bishop Amolo later. For Jesus' sake, amen. Okay, so 1 Kings chapter 4. Moving on to Solomon's administration. Now, four... Uh, Chapters 4 and 5 are kind of informational type chapters. They're not, um, it, it sort of details that, that to us we may not really see a purpose for, but there is a purpose there. It's God's word. Uh, laying out the details of how he is going to exercise his administration, and we'll notice uh, remember Solomon's mark, the thing that set him apart was his great wisdom. Uh, and we'll notice that part of his great wisdom is the ability to delegate. Uh, not to micromanage everything in his kingdom, but to choose men capable of doing various tasks and simply letting them do their thing. So that, that is part of Solomon's overall wisdom, is knowing how to, how to work with other people and and uh, utilize the talents that God has given to them. So 1 Kings chapter 4, we'll just start off with verses 1 through 6. So Solomon, so King Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were his officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok the priest. Uh, Elihoreph, the son of Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, scribes. Jehoshaphat, the son of uh, Ahilud, the recorder. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army. Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers. Uh, Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest and the king's friend. Ahishar, over the household. And Ador, let's try that one again. Adoniram, the son of Abda, over the labor force. Okay, this is, this is his cabinet, basically. These names here, his closest uh, chosen uh, advisors and those to whom he delegates these particular tasks. Uh, now, yeah, on the handout then, we go through the various asterisks. The first, Solomon's main attribute as king was his wisdom, and one does see wisdom in action here. He's not a micromanager. He entrusts men capable in certain areas of expertise with leadership roles. Next asterisk. The first person on the list is the high priest. So verse 2, uh, Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest. Now the order listed gives a clue about the order of importance. Solomon made right faith a priority in his kingdom. The high priest was a hereditary office. Zadok had occupied this position at first. Uh, in, in fact, as we saw last couple of weeks, uh, there was a point in time under King David where there were two high priests, which did not work. Uh, and, and, and in fact, was contrary to God's original design that he had given to Moses and Aaron. There should have been one high priest. For some reason, David allowed two high priests. And, and you know, as, as the expression goes, something about multiple cooks in a kitchen, uh, it doesn't work. So they turned out to be competing high priests. They chose sides. Uh, uh, Abiathar, the other high priest, sided against King David. Uh, Zadok stayed with David, so it was a mess. So uh, uh, eventually Abiathar is replaced. Zadok becomes the sole high priest, and now Zadok's son takes over the office. At least he's called his son, but this too is kind of interesting, as we'll see here in a minute. So the high priesthood was hereditary. Zadok occupied it at first. By the time this list is composed... It's his grandson who would assume the office. So the name given in verse 2, Azariah, it says, son of Zadok, the priest. In actuality, Azariah is the grandson of Zadok. Now that, that too is kind of interesting. 
because it, it shows something we've seen previously in other Bible studies when it comes to genealogies. It doesn't always, in the Jewish mind, when they listed genealogies, they didn't, when they said son of, it doesn't always mean direct son of. There are instances, rare ones albeit, like here, where it, when it says son of, it actually means grandson or possibly even great-grandson at times. So there, there are, you know, to, uh, to, to us and our way of doing things, this would be a gap. But from their standpoint, when they're simply tracing uh, the heredity within tribes and such, skipping a generation like that in the lists of things is not considered uh, uh, wrong or anything. It's just the way they did it. So Zadok's actual son, his name was uh, Ahimaz. He was the father of Azariah, and we don't know exactly what happened to him. Uh, it's thought he was the high priest at first, but he, he may have died or something, and his son took over uh, on his behalf, which is why he's called Zadok's son here. But anyway, it's a, it's a curiosity but it does show something about how the Jews reckon things maybe differently than we do. But at any rate, one of the things Solomon does in his wisdom, first thing on the list, he aligns himself with a proper high priest, a single high priest, and does away with the confusion of a double high priesthood. Next asterisk, Zadok and Abiathar are mentioned as priests. So yeah, skip down a little bit more. Uh, let's see what verse was that. Verse 4, Zadok and Abiath are the priests. Um, this presumably after Zadok had relinquished the high priesthood to his grandson. Uh, this is curious that Abiathar is mentioned because in the uh, two chapters ago, he was actually exiled by Solomon. So is this simply respect for his office that he's mentioned again? Uh, or is it possible the list was compiled before his exile? Again, not sure. But he's mentioned here, even though he has been deposed for treason. Uh, next asterisk. There are two Azariahs listed. The second is the son of Nathan, the prophet. And Zabad being the other son who is called a priest and a friend of Solomon, verse 5. And that's kind of, I don't know, it's, there's something particularly personal about that. It's not just a cold list. You know, they list Zabad as the king's friend. What a title to bear. <laughs> what do you do? I'm the king's friend. But a priest... And in this list, in his cabinet list, if you kind of look at the thing as a whole, you see a total of, I think it's four priests in this cabinet. So he aligns himself very closely with the church in his kingdom. They occupy the major positions of advisement to the king. He surrounds himself with priests, and it's a priest who's called his closest friend. So he's, he's obviously establishing a kingdom based on faith. Uh, one more note on the cabinet. In verse 6, this Ahishar, it says over the household, he is the only name in the list not called the son of. His name stands alone. Uh, now, uh, biblical scholars have, have thought perhaps it seems likely that he does not have a genealogy within Israel, which suggests he may not be Jewish. So he may be a non-Jew, converted, and he, the fact he's placed over Solomon's household, you know, he's the manager of Solomon's home and home affairs, uh, which probably involves the harem and those sorts of things. This is a position uh, very close to Solomon and, and a position that you would want your absolutely most trusted guy because if there's going to be an assassination attempt, it's going to happen at home when the king's guard is down. So you want somebody you can trust with your life. And that Solomon would invest that kind of trust in a non-Jew 
uh, if in fact that is, is the case because his genealogy isn't listed. Um, that he must have been a man of tremendous integrity that Solomon could, could invest that sort of trust in him. So that's the, that's the inner circle right there that Solomon surrounds himself with. And again, the names and everything may at first seem to be sort of, you know, why, are, why is God's word telling us this? But it does show us that part of wisdom is surrounding oneself with faith. And it wasn't just a Sunday thing he did or a Saturday thing in those days where he worshipped in the temple that he would build someday, at the tabernacle, at the, at the altar, uh, before the ark. It's not just a matter of worship. He surrounded himself with advisors who would speak the faith to him constantly. Every decision he made was faith-based, at least in the, in the beginning. All right, any thoughts, any comments, any questions? Pressing on. Yeah, there's one name listed in there. I just made a, made a note of him in the last asterisk of that section, this uh, Adoniram, he is listed where? Where did we see that name? Spirit Benaiah, son of the Azariah, the king of Abiashar. Oh, there he is, the very last son listed. Uh, over the labor force, Adoniram over the labor force. In, in, in 1218, he is the one name that comes to a rather horrible end. Uh, he's stoned to death by Israel itself. Uh, because part of his being in charge of the labor force also meant tax collection, and that uh, people didn't like paying taxes, so they killed him. Good lesson for the IRS today. All right, verses 7 and following, then. We'll just read this as a block. I won't make any of you suffer with these names, because I can't get through them myself. And Solomon had 12 governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provision for one month of the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur. Had a movie made after him. Complete fiction. Ben-Hur in the mountains of Ephraim. Uh, Ben-Decker. Ben, by the way, means son. Uh, Ben-Decker. In Machaz, uh, these, are, these are districts, I guess, areas. In Shalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon, Beth Hanan. Uh, ben Hesed in Erubath, to him belong Saka and all the land of Hefer. Ben Abinabed oof, in all the regions of Dor. Uh, Verse 12, uh, Benah, the son of Elihud in Tanakh, uh, Megiddo, all Beth Shan, which is beside the Zeratans. I'm not going to read through all of these names because I can't pronounce them mostly. But uh, suffice it to say, if you kind of read through Verse 19, it's simply a list of different names of people who are now the governors. It's the same number of governors as there are tribes in Israel. However, curiously, they are not all governors over one tribe. Because the areas that are listed, if you compare them to the boundaries of the various tribes of Israel, don't match up. So they are given districts that at times include more than one tribe, although they're the same number of governors as there are tribes. Uh, another note on the handout, uh, Himaz, verse 15, does not have a father listed. Um, we do know that Zadok had a son by that name, so if this is his son, it is yet another connection to the church. One of the governors Solomon chooses is, is of the church. And there are two son-in-laws of Solomon listed. So all people he trusts implicitly. Verses 20 to 21. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. 
So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. All right. Now, the, the words here, the, the expression, more numerous than the sand by the sea, that should remind us of the covenant God made with Abraham when he was blessing him, and it was a messianic blessing. He would have more descendants than the stars of the heaven and the sand of the sea. Uh, and in him, that blessing went on, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So in the, in the Abrahamic covenant, when God was promising descendants, they were Christological descendants. They were descendants of faith through Christ. They weren't just biological descendants, which unfortunately is the way the Jews came to understand the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, but it was through Christ. So the language here, hearkening back to this covenant, kind of places a Christological character on this. This is a kingdom of faith, that God is blessing the faith of these people, and they are actually God's children, included in the Abrahamic covenant through Christ. Uh, this, is, this is Israel's golden age. If there ever was one, this is it, even more so than the Davidic kingdom. Uh, there's peace, there's blessings of God, there's faith at the helm. It's, a, it's a, the golden age and Israel will never experience it again. Very short-lived. All right, any other comments? Right. I mean, it was their good old days, yeah. And it, I, I'm sure in the mind of Israel, it was, it was kind of when they, when they asked Jesus that question, they were thinking, are you going to take us back to the good old days again? Yeah. They always had in mind political things as opposed to, to matters of faith. There is, <coughs> excuse me, there is one curiosity in verse 20. Uh, that Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand. Why well, mention both of these? Because at this point in time, the kingdom is not divided. There is only one kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And yet it mentions the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. <coughs> why, why would that be? <clears throat> well, through whom does the messianic promise go? Which tribe? Isn't it Judah? So the mention of Judah here, again, is sort of a, a very subtle uh, Christ reference. The kingdom is not divided. There is no Judah and Israel yet in terms of kingdoms. There will be very shortly, but there's not yet. So why mention it? Because Judah is the Messianic line. So Israel, the people in general, were being blessed with great numbers, but blessed, first of all, through Judah, through the Messianic line. So again, this, is, this, this language connecting with the Abrahamic covenant and the tribe of Judah all point to it is ultimately through Christ that all these people are being blessed. Uh, the faith that's being built by Solomon is a Messianic faith, anticipating Christ and the redemption. So these, these are people that share our faith. They're not just Old Testament Jews. These, these are Christians who are anticipating Christ uh, and will ultimately join us, uh, or we join them in the true faith. All right, any other thoughts? Verse 22 to 28. Now... Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep beside deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl, for he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from the, from the uh, Tifsa even 
to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba all the days of Solomon. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And as governors, each man in his month provided food for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table, there was no lack in their supply. They also brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and steeds, each man according to his charge. All right. So huge amounts of, of food and supplies required each day. So on the handout, you see a core is the equivalent of about six and a half bushels. So when it says he had, uh, where were the cores? Uh, verse 22, for his, his provision for one day was 30 cores. So that's 100 and uh, what, close to 200. Six times, six and a half times 30. Quick, math teacher, close to 200 bushels. Uh, and 400 bushels a meal. So that's, you know, that's a lot of consumption per day. Uh, but there is, there is a, a very subtle foreshadowing in this of difficulties to come. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 17. 14 to 17. This is God's command to kings. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 17. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you, whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said, you shall not return again that way. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. God's specific command to Israel when they were coming into the promised land, and a command talking about the kings they would have, specifically says, not a lot of horses, not a lot of gold, not a lot of wives. Then you look at what it just tells us about Solomon. Uh, verse 26 in 1 Kings 4, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. And then all of the, the monetary things necessary to supply it all. What it hasn't told us yet about is, is, is the wives. So... That foreshadows something off. Even though Solomon is a man of great faith, there is still something, again, there's a blind spot. And he tends to be ignoring what God said about all the horses and all that to the point where the uh, kings here specifically mentions all these horses. Now, uh, presumably, these horses are part of his military. And maybe you could make an argument that God intended personal horses and, you know, not national horses, per se, as the problem. But Solomon is doing things on the edge of what God said should be done. In fact, outright violating what God said should be done, even though he's a man of faith. Now, simultaneously, Satan's sinner, even the, most, the wisest man on earth, was a, a victim of his sinful flesh. Yeah, of course, the text doesn't say, but one would hope with four priests in his inner cabinet that would know God's word. And they still, they had Deuteronomy, they had God's word, they had the Ark of the Covenant yet. So Moses' writings were, were kept in that, which was right in Jerusalem where they could consult it. So one would assume they knew what Deuteronomy said and read what we read. Yeah, I, I, there's no way of knowing whether he was advised or not. His priests were faithful men, so one would assume they would speak faithfully. 
All right, any other thoughts there before we move along? Verse 29 to 34. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrite and Heman, uh, Calical and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He also spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. All right, so wisdom, one, coupled with knowledge, understanding, great understanding, and largeness of heart. Uh, the, the Hebrew there, the, the word that English is translating heart, can also mean uh, the mind. Uh, but, but it seems to be implying compassion, that, that he was a man not just of broad knowledge, but of compassion. Uh, very Christological, again. He was, it was of faith. But the, the, the union of wisdom with knowledge is such a rare thing. There's so many people with knowledge with no wisdom guiding it. And there are many, many people, but they, you know, their knowledge is not broad. Because once you get into the academic world and start learning things, it seems wisdom goes right out the window sometimes. Um, but Solomon, Solomon had it all, including even kindness, even, a, even a, a, a compassionate heart. Uh, note also, uh, he was skilled in writing, uh, poetry. He writes songs. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. So he's a, he's a, a composer, which, which, which speaks of creativity. Besides knowledge and wisdom, he, had, he was blessed with creativity, which is also coupling that with all the other attributes listed here. This would put Solomon really as one of the absolute greatest minds who has ever lived. You know, when you get into PhD programs, one of the things they demand of you is creativity. They don't just want knowledge. They want you to, to write and address something that nobody else has, something unique to you. Well, Solomon's creativity is specifically mentioned here. And, 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 and music, you know, that too is an intellectual step that many don't take. And, and, and poetry, he was concerned with the, the beauty of words together. So Solomon has it all. He's truly a, a tremendous mind. But it's all blessings. It's all a, a unique gift from God. All right, verse 34 uh, kind of hints at Solomon's missionary strategy, if you will, um, because everybody heard about what Solomon was, that he was this, this, uh, a mind that no one else could compare to. And they all come to listen to him. There's no internet to Zoom him, so you got to go sit in front of him and listen to him. So, yeah, it's an amazing thing. We, we don't often think of Solomon in terms of being a towering intellect, but he truly was. All right, so that's chapter 4. Any comments, any thoughts on chapter 4? All preliminary things, all things, to, all things to kind of set up Solomon's character and the way God is working through him, but also in such a way as to remind us Christ is at the heart of this because we have these little messianic hints throughout this description of Solomon. Now chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We'll read a big block at once here. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon. 
because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always loved David. Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know how my father David could not build a house in the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under his soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build a house in my name. Now therefore command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon. And my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know there is none among us who has skill to cut lumber like the Sidonians." So it was when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over his, this great people. And Hiram sent, sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and cypress logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you indicate to me, and will have them broken apart there, then you can take them away, and you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, and 20 cores of pressed oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, as he had promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, uh, and the two of them made a treaty together. Okay, so Hiram is a Phoenician king, uh, centered in the area of Tyre, and he was friends with King David. And I have a reference in Solomon where their friendship was forged. So he's, he's an older, why, well not wiser, but he's an older man than Solomon, uh, he knew Solomon's family, and he seems also to have known God, known the true God, because he does mention how uh, the Lord, and you'll notice in the text that it is, it is capitalized. Uh, verse, let's see, where is that? Where, where Hiram addresses David? Verse, excuse me? 12. Verse 12, so the Lord gave Solomon wisdom. Uh, yeah, there's earlier than that, Hi, when Hiram is talking to Solomon, he says, the Lord has put a son, seven. verse 7, so it was Hiram heard Solomon, he rejoiced. yes, that's the one, thank you. So blessed be the Lord this day, and you notice the Lord is all capitalized, which means this is the Hebrew word Yahweh, so he knows, he knows the name of the true God. Now, if he's a typical pagan king, he would accept that and just add the true God into the list of all the other gods he had, which may be the case. But he does, he does at least know the name of the true God and recognize this God's hand in Solomon and David's kingdom. So the cedars, the, the, the specific request of Solomon is for the cedars in Hiram's kingdom. The cedars of Lebanon. Uh, you've got a little thing on them there. They, they were something special. They're, they, still, they still exist, but not like they did. The Lebanon forests uh, are no more. There are now a couple of patches, kind of you know, like, the, like the redwoods of, of California. There's a few stands of redwoods left, or, or the sequoias, a few stands left, but they don't cover the landscape like they maybe used to. Here again, they don't cover the landscape, there's just a few patches. Um, but, you know, why are they so special? Well, this is why. Uh, giant, beautiful evergreen trees grow in mountainous regions. Uh, Lebanon cedars have imposing trunks, dense, iconic crowns that become characteristically flat-headed, etc. Um, their, dark, their bark is dark gray, the wood's beautiful light tone, hard, astonishingly decay-resistant, as all cedar is. Uh, the gum they secrete has a sweet aroma. Despite their exposed position, the trees remain evergreen, never shed their leaves, are always fragrant. And it's said that God himself planted these cedars. In fact, there is a stand of cedars in Lebanon today. If you want to go and see the cedars of Lebanon, that's called 
what's it called? Something like the, the, the Garden of God or something like that, the, the recognition that God planted them. So they can be found in Lebanon, south central Turkey, and Cyprus. They can reach a height of 130 feet. The trunk can reach eight feet in diameter. Uh, there's the Lebanese flag on the top of page three, which features the cedars of Lebanon, so it's still part of their, their uh, identification. Uh, the cedars of Lebanon were also used by the Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, Romans, and Persians to construct houses and temples. The Egyptians used cedar resin for the mummification process, and Jews used the peel of the Lebanese cedar in circumcision and treatment of leprosy. The Ottomans used cedar wood as fuel for railway engines because it burned much better than traditional oak since cedar contains oil. The Roman Emperor Hadrian in the second century AD attempted to protect the forest with boundary markers carved into rocks. Over 200 such markers have been identified allowing scholars to make an approximation of the extent of the forest in those times. In 1876, Queen Victoria of Great Britain ordered a protective wall to be built around a 102 hectare grove, but deforestation continued despite this. It wasn't until the late 20th century that cedars were declared a protected natural resource. By then, this immense forest had been reduced to just a couple of hundred specimens that grew in a handful of isolated patches. Yeah, it's amazing that it wasn't until the 20th century that these things are actually protected. But throughout history, these have been the premier wood to use. So naturally, in the construction of God's temple, uh, Solomon would want to use the best available resources. And this was it. So this treaty with Hiram is huge. The, the, the construction of the temple wouldn't have proceeded the same way without it. Uh, in Second Chronicles, we won't look at this. Uh, there's a, a more detailed conversation between Hiram and Solomon listed, uh, but nonetheless, this, is, uh, this sort of summarizes it in 1 Kings 5. And the distance between where these trees are harvested and where they wind up is 104 miles as the bird flies. So we, we also know, they, as the description lays out, they put these in the water, they float them to near Jerusalem in rafts, at least somehow near Jerusalem. There's no direct river that goes from Tyre right to Jerusalem. And then haul them out and drag them by cart or something from there. So that's a long ways to take huge trees. These are probably hundreds of years old, too. Uh, when I was in Taiwan, uh, one of the sites I was taken to to see was the, the cedar trees of Taiwan, which were also in the mountainous area. And some of these cedars there were four, five, six hundred years old. So it's sort of a national treasure in Taiwan, too, these cedars. All right, any thoughts before we finish this out? OK. Uh, verse 13, then, through the end of chapter 5. Then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. And they were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adorn, Ad, Adoniram was in charge of the labor force. Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stones in the mountains. Besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the people who labored in the work. And king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the temple. So Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and the Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. All right. So the best craftsmen from the known area around them were all engaged in this. It was a multinational task, not just Israel, but the amount of, of uh, involvement of Israel in the work is just massive, as you can see. This is a, you know, the major part of the entire population of Israel is involved in this in one way or another. This, this was a huge national project. And the goal was to build a temple unrivaled by anything the world had ever seen, because, you know, God was... The true God was being 
glorified in this process. Imagine, imagine the expense of moving those kinds of people around and feeding them and housing them. You know, the, the logistical nightmare, just the, the guy God raised up at that point in time as the logistical expert had to have been a genius too to keep all of the parts moving for this. Uh, so God is blessing Israel with a lot of different people at the same time, all extremely capable in their field to make this all come together. And Solomon sort of sits at the head managing it all. All right, so that's kind of it for chapters 4 and chapter 5. Any, any thoughts? Any questions? All right, then let's close with prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, we do thank you as we look back for all the blessings that you have given to your people throughout time, for the way that you have blessed faith and united your people around your Son and his grace. We pray this day that we may enjoy the same blessings and grant us their faith and their confidence in you to bring us through all of our troubles, to strengthen us and forgive us for Jesus' sake. Amen.